Good afternoon. Welcome to UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Uh, and today is a very special day for our Grand Rounds. We're just thrilled to have our old friend Rob Califf uh, join us. Give you a short bio, uh, and the, the format here will just be a conversation. Uh, Rob was confirmed last year as the 25th Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. He actually also was the 22nd serving in 2016 to 2017 in that role. Uh, between uh, those those stints, he was uh, in charge of healthcare at Verily, which is part of the Alphabet Google family. Prior to that, uh, he spent most of his career at Duke University, where he was professor of medicine, vice chancellor for clinical and translational research, uh, and director of the Duke Translational Medicine Institute, and he actually founded the Duke Clinical Research Institute, which is really the preeminent clinical research institute in the United States, if not the world. Uh, he is a preeminent leader in the field of cardiology and evidence-based medicine and quality uh, and outcomes research. I think he's published more than a thousand peer-reviewed uh, papers. Uh, really, uh, it's hard to think of someone whose career has been as distinguished in uh, in the world of healthcare and academia and in healthcare policy. Uh, started it all at UCSF as a UCSF medicine resident back in the day. And, uh, and so we consider him part of the family and, uh, and, and are really proud of the things that he has done. So, Rob, if you could come on. Welcome. Hello. It's great to see you. Good to be here. Uh, so we'll, we'll cover all sorts of stuff. We'll start with some COVID things. But before we get there, I've, uh, I've had a chance to interview Ashish Jha and uh, Eric Topol, both also UCSF Medicine Residency graduates, and started the conversation asking them about to reminisce a little bit about their time at UCSF and how it uh, shaped their career. So let me start with, with that one for you. Really an amazing impact on my career. You know, I arrived as an intern. I'd never been west of the Mississippi before. Um, took up a place at Buena Vista Park. Um, we had a child who was born a couple of months before coming out. And within a month, we found out she had severe congenital heart disease and underwent a major operation while I was an intern it was in the ICU for a month. Oh my God. And uh, the two years, uh, I was that was the time of fast tracking. So the two years I was there, we had a very intense experience. But the support and uh, help and friendship and camaraderie, camaraderie was just amazing. All the while learning uh, a huge amount about medicine and how things work. Those were the days of Holly Smith, the... Uh, you knew well, yeah. uh, a, a real leader. Um, there were Larry Tierney was around. I mean, Eric Topol was one of my interns. Uh, right. I taught him everything, all the good things that he knows, not the bad things. That he, <laughs> um, and he has turned into quite a leader. But you know, he was one of many during that time. It was really formative and a, a great experience for me. That's great. Did you know you wanted to do cardiology when you got here? I did. I had made that transformation. Um, really, I was going to be a clinical psychologist as an undergrad. Then I worked two years in the prison system in South Carolina and concluded that I wanted to do something that was more tangible. And the first time I saw someone get defibrillated, I said, this is tangible. So <laughs> 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 I was dead to someone who's alive. So much more tangible than that. Yeah. And that was the fast track, you know, two years of medicine, then went right into cardiology mm -hmm. uh, back at Duke from there. And I, I still have some regrets because by the time, you know, we had made that decision early and uh, Letty and I both really fell in love with San Francisco. As you know, between my two stents at FDA, we lived in the Presidio uh, yeah. and, you know, s still spent time uh, at UCSF. What a, gr what a great place. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's start with COVID. We'll move on to a bunch of different things. But uh, it seems like the biggest decision on your plate now is the is the vaccine and uh, whether you can get the bivalent after six months. Uh, I'll give you the opportunity to make some news here. You can announce it if you want. Or, But tell us just how, how, how you and I understand it's an awfully big organization. You don't make every decision. But how are you thinking about that decision? Well, I mean, you know all the factors, and I think you've covered them well in your other uh, grand rounds. Um, you know, the first point is every boost that we've done so far has resulted in best estimate 80 to 90 percent reduction in death and hospitalization over and above what had been achieved with 
the previous boost before that. We're now out where most people who are were up to date with the last, uh, the first bivalent opportunity are now getting six months out. I'm 71 years old and I'm uh, about seven months out now. Um, uh, I think I communicated with you. I got infected about two months after getting my vaccination, so decision making is a little complicated. But you know, we're planning. It's well known based on the advisory committee meetings that we're planning on doing something major in the fall. And the question now is, do we do something in the interim? And all I can say now is, we're looking carefully at the data. Um, it's obvious from the timing that decisions are imminent, but I can't make the news today of saying what the decision is. A little disappointed when when you see articles like the Washington Post covered and said that that is what the decision is going to be. What do you what do you think in your perch? Is, is, is it that somebody leaked that, or is is that good that it sort of gets out there before the thing happens? How how do you when you pick up the paper in the morning and see that? What what do you think? Well, I don't want to sound cynical, but I um you know I grew up in academia where rumors abound just like they do everywhere else, and certainly. In the world of Washington and the press, it's, you know, um, the press is under tremendous pressure to break news, just as you were just trying to do. Uh, exactly. I uh, feel like great pressure here, right? And you'll find that leaks half the time are um, leaks of real truthful information. Half the time they're intended to cause a stir, a, a fire off somewhere else to take people's eyes off the issue that's really in play. And I can't say which one this is. Well, we'll all right. All right. I'm out center. All right. Well, let's go on a little bit. Uh, what's, one of the things I found interesting with Paxlovid was that you were out there sort of promoting the use of the drug. It, I think a little bit more than I've been used to with prior FDA commissioners, maybe in your prior tenure. First of all, do you feel like that's right? And second of all, how do you make that decision whether to, because in some ways you're there to approve the drug, but you were out there really encouraging people to take it. Sure. I, you know, I don't think uh, any FDA commissioner alive has been through uh, a pandemic like this. So I think this is a very unusual situation that we're in. Um, normally, the system works beautifully. And as you well know, and, you know, noting that the clinical research as to much of my career has been in a very orderly world of uh, ready, aim, fire. You have an idea, it goes through a translational research process. Um, if it's good enough, it gets into humans. Um, Ninety percent of uh, drugs who get into human clinical trials don't make it to market because the ben the benefits don't outweigh the risks. Um, and then once it's on the market, the companies which are going to make a profit on it uh, do the advertising. And we uh, think you can think of the FDA as a referee. And you're right; in normal times, the FDA should not be a cheerleader. The um, the FDA is a referee calling balls and strikes or um, uh, shots before or after the clock, something I'm still paying by with the NCAA right. tournament. But um, in this case, we're in the middle of a pandemic. People are dying at very high rates. And in this case, we actually had a phase three trial that showed this dramatic reduction in death and hospitalization well over and above vaccination. And we were able to see data because of the magnificent job that Israel in particular was doing of collecting uh, real-world evidence that showed that it wasn't just an artifact of a phase three clinical trial that actually was being borne out in the real world. So I felt I had an obligation as a public health official to point out that the evidence was strong. Also remember that with an EUA, the company can't advertise. Um, and the purchasing is not done by uh, sales reps selling the hospitals and practices. It's uh, bulk purchasing by the government. So I felt we did have a public health obligation to make it clear to the public and to hopefully to practicing um, clinicians, doctors and nurses and pharmacists that, um, you know, the people who are dying, by the time we had vaccination and antivirals, almost everyone who was dying or uh, getting severely ill, was not up to date on vaccination and had not been given the opportunity to take an antiviral. So that was what was uh, driving me. Um, I think in the time of a pandemic, you have to make a lot of this. It's more like being an ICU doc than it is 
um, a doc is in a um, situation where you can give advice and have the patient come back three months later. You got to make decisions. You got to be wrong some of the time, and uh, criticism is fair. I feel like I was right in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. I guess I'm just wondering and how much you guys thought about drawing the line. So, you know, uh, uh, next week, Grand Rounds is on all the new goal-directed therapies for heart failure. I'm sure there are plenty of people not on them, and it will cost people's lives. How, how do you decide where to draw the line now that you crossed it for Paxlovid? And, and obviously, within the context of pandemic, and that's not a pandemic, but I think, you know, in, in some ways, it'll create a little bit of a, dif a difficult situation because there are other drugs that people should be taking that they don't take that that have real health consequences. Well, um, it is in our mission statement that we are accountable to the public for giving people truthful and reliable information that will enable them to use medical products and eat a diet which is safe and effective or healthy in the case of diet. So, we have some obligation there, but there is there is a line between um, promoting something and giving advice that's generally good for health or the safe and effective use of products. And I feel like heart failure is an example. Uh, obviously, being a cardiologist, I've done a lot of trials in heart failure. I feel very competent in that area. And the I think the industry and the professional societies have a real obligation there through guidelines and um promulgation of their data. Our job there is more like a referee. If, if someone makes a claim with faults or goes over the line, um, we should step in. And in the background, you know, at one point I make, uh, I love the analogy of FDA as a referee. You can tell that already. I think it's the way we should be thought about. But, you know, referees, I don't know if you've done any refereeing in your career, but referees love it when the contestants play a good game. Mm-hmm. So we will cheer on in the background. If we see a treatment that's reducing the risk of death or having a big impact on quality of life, we'll cheer on in the background, but we should not be in the in the foreground in that case. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, you mentioned one of the challenges is, is misinformation. I know you've thought a lot about that. In some ways, it was one of the unique attributes of the of the pandemic. What have you come to understand about the information ecosystem uh, and 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 sort of what we need to do to combat some of the misinformation. Well, this is, as you know, this has been an interest of mine well before the pandemic because I, um, you pointed out, if you look at cardiovascular disease, people are dying because they're not doing things as it, that are clearly beneficial. And, you know, when it comes to the medical part of it, the pharmacology, um, you know, we have these whole classes of drugs that are profoundly effective and very inexpensive now because of the generic system, and yet still people are not um, availing themselves, often because they're being misled by counter information that takes them off on a tangent, and sometimes by people who are selling um, uh, wares that are um, known to be ineffective or even dangerous. And I, you know, I have great slides of snake oil salesmen. They really did exist. Literally, people were selling snake oil. Um, but at that time, the way they advertised was in newspapers and magazines. It was hard to reach people. Now, someone who knows nothing about the topic but thought about it for 10 minutes can reach a billion people in 10 minutes. And so, um, but I will also say the government is limited in its abilities to speak. Um, when it comes to um, opinion, uh, we have to stick to the evidence and the facts. Uh, um, we should not be suppressing people's free right to uh, speech uh, in the government, and I believe in that. But we also, as we've been discussing, have an obligation to emphasize uh, truth and reliable information as we know it. And in some cases where people have crossed the line and are uh, giving out what I would call disinformation, misinformation that's meant to harm people. Um, we do have legal authority if it's a company that we regulate to do something about that. Now, the academics in that, I would turn that one back to you because um, we shouldn't be interfering with academic right to speech, even if it's a lie. Uh, the First Amendment enables you to lie. But um, what peers should do 
you know, I'll just go on for just a second more on this. I, because there's so much mistrust in government and because our um, ability to speak as government is limited, that's all part of the um, origin of America is personal freedom and not being commandeered by a government. Um, I think someone asked me this morning, what, what is the network that you need? Well, I, I think the network we need uh, is mostly made up of clinicians and healthcare experts when it comes to health um, who are joined together as a truth network, seeking the truth and promoting it every day. And I, I don't mean that in a small C way. I mean, when you see a person in clinic, unless you ask them, you may have no idea that they were on the internet getting uh, entirely contradictory information before and after clinic. And it's your job, I think, to um, correct that. And people that are promoting misinformation in academia, I think the institutions and the faculty shouldn't suppress them, but should give um, the other view in a, in a forceful way. Yeah, no, you and I have talked about this offline. It's it's a really tough problem. And, you know, in some ways, I and many of my colleagues have tried to do just that to put out good information, but I think probably have not sort of gone and combat directly taken on the misinformation, which is tough sometimes as a colleague. And uh, uh, I think it's a perfectly reasonable argument that we should have been or should be more forceful about it. I worry about it because I don't see any good reason why it's going to be limited to COVID. As you say, you know, it happens in cardiology. I think you're going to start seeing misinformation around cancer treatments. And you know, why is it just going to be one particular disease state? It's as old as uh, humankind, I think, the snake oil component. And I do think this is not the time to sit on the sidelines because the evidence of the problem is our declining life expectancy, which is remarkable and unique among high-income countries. And I think it's very much driven whether you're talking about COVID or um, opioids or the chronic diseases, which are now in a resurgence. It, it, it's not that the right information isn't out there. It's being drowned out by a lot of other information and obviously also social factors that we just can't sit on the sideline. We have to be active. While I'm in this job, I'm uh, you know adhering to limits of the government has, but it doesn't mean I can't get on you a little bit about what I see as your responsibility to. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, it, it definitely uh, gave was was gave me a lot of uh, of cause for thinking hard about uh, about what our responsibility is, and my responsibility. Um, let's finish up with COVID. What do you think? You've talked a little bit about misinformation as one lesson. What are the enduring lessons from COVID for the FDA? Uh, how, how's how is the FDA going to be, or has how is it a different organization than what is than it was in 2019 because of COVID? Well, I would say in general, the FDA has gained a lot of confidence because of COVID. It wasn't, you know, at the beginning, no one knew what was going on. All these decisions needed to be made. I wasn't there. I was talking to you, and you know, thanks for providing a reliable source throughout this um, entire time. But I think when you look back, a lot of really good decisions were made by the FDA while. The same people were making decisions about the routine everyday business the FDA has to do and dealing with something that we don't talk enough about, which was the ongoing disruption of supply chains. As I like to say, every supply chain that we deal with has been disrupted except for tobacco. Now, explain that to me. The one I would like to be disrupted is still going strong and has through the whole thing. Um, I think. So, so I'd, I'd say there's a lot of confidence um, in the people, but people are tired. It's been, you know, I think just like your clinical faculty on the front lines who have, you know, worked night and day often and under a lot of stress, the same has held for people at the FDA. We're very worried right now, and uh, there's a lot of talk about, about from historians now about this um, pandemic amnesia, as it's being called it. Shortly after a pandemic, people don't want to talk about it. And right now we're having, it's Congress is not going to put money into being ready for the next yeah. pandemic. I, we're very worried about that because, um, you, you know, the health agencies have to do everything they were doing before, plus the new stuff, just like your healthcare uh, clinicians had to take care of all the routine diseases while they were also dealing with the onslaught of COVID. And 
I think we have a good idea of what needs to be done next time. I think Ashish, Ja, another one of your great um, products at UCSF, as you mentioned, um, I think has a good handle on it. But, you know, as has been, he's verified, it's not uh, gossip from newspapers. He'll be moving on sometime soon. Mm -hmm. There'll be a pandemic prepared in his office, but if it doesn't have funding, we're not going to be not going to be ready. We do have plans now. I think we know what to do with vaccines. I think um, the development of antibodies and antivirals for the infectious epidemics, the playbook for that is good. I think we learned about diagnostic testing um, that, you know, the countries that did it the best developed, had a few test developers and really invested in those early on and made them available to the public. So another worry I have is uh, COVID testing soon will be in the private system. Mm -hmm. And I would guess people like you and me will have COVID tests sitting around, but our disadvantaged patients probably won't because they won't have the money to make the purchase. Yep. Yeah, it's really a conundrum. It's amazing how quickly you would have. I would have thought this would have at least a five-year tell where there would be still <laughs> people would be thinking hard about this and how to prepare for the next thing. But once people decided they were over COVID, they really decided they were over it. Well, apparently, and I haven't done the reading to to know, um, to verify all this, but what I'm being told by experts is that two or three years after the, one of these events, uh, policy uh begins to be okay to talk about again. Hmm. Apparently, like in 1920, you couldn't even talk about influenza at a cocktail party. You would be thrown out as, you know, being socially unacceptable. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's move on. This will be related, I think, to some of the maybe lessons learned, but it seems like, you know, an enduring tension for the FDA is, is the need for speed versus the need for deliberateness and, and, and the evidence bar I think that's gotten tested in a major way with the Alzheimer's drugs. Uh, where do you think you've landed and what do you think the lessons learned from the experience with Agile Helm was and, and now there are new drugs coming down the pike? This is, this is the issue of using surrogate markers, the issue of a disease that's just terrible where there's nothing for people and an obvious desire for people to have something. Uh, and, and you're in the position of trying to be the referee and decide is it good enough? Sure. So a few things about that. First, um, there are a lot of terrible diseases, as you all know, in a place like UCSF that don't have effective treatments. Uh, the American public has spoken through its um, elected officials in a set of laws that make accelerate approval a lay of the land. Um, and, and essentially what that's saying is that we're willing to take more risk for the opportunity to have access to a treatment that may be effective. And the general criterion is based on either an intermediate clinical endpoint or a unvalidated surrogate where the officials at the FDA believe that it's reasonably likely that the clinical benefits outweigh the clinical risks. I want to emphasize the unvalidated part because where we have truly validated surrogates, that can get a full approval, but we don't have many of those. And it's a, it's a real point with academia that needs to be emphasized a validated surrogate doesn't mean that there's a relationship between um, a surrogate marker and outcome. It means that the change in the surrogate reliably predicts the change in the outcome with a variety of interventions. Can you, for, for, for people who don't follow this closely, can you give an example of a validated versus an unvalidated surrogate? Sure. Viral load with HIV is like the preeminent validated surrogate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you drop the viral load, um, across a variety of different types of medicines, you get an improvement um, in your clinical status. Um, LDL cholesterol is another um, example. But here we go. Even with a validated surrogate, when you put something new in the system, you don't, you're not 100% sure. You're, you're uh, fairly sure. Mm -hmm. uh, an example of, uh, of a surrogate that's not validated, in fact, it can't be validated as HDL cholesterol, right? There's a good relationship between low HDL cholesterol and um, atherosclerosis, but with drugs that lower HDL cholesterol in general, they've either done nothing or had an adverse effect. Right. There are one or two that may have a beneficial effect. So um, 
the, the correlation uh, does not make a surrogate. It's really demonstrating. So to get to have validate surrogate, you got to have both surrogate measurement and outcome measurement, which is a high bar. So an unvalidated surrogate, um, you know, uh, the biggest use of that now is in the case of um, a genetically modif uh, genetically caused disease where you have a protein expressed that's not right, and you can show with your treatment that it changes the protein in the right direction. Um, you know, I think most people would say if you had an untreatable disease in a child, that's good enough. Uh, what parent is going to stand by and not get the treatment? But the um, price to pay for that opportunity for the industry is to do the follow-up trial to show that the answer um, is right. And that's been a problem. And, you know, the good news is in the omnibus legislation they went through last year, we now have the authority at FDA to require something that was standard in the big cardiovascular areas where often you develop, um, let's say, an LDL lowering treatment. You would develop the first indication for familial hypercholesterolemia, but you would start your big outcome trial in the general population for secondary prevention before you had the um, approval. Mm -hmm. So that way we can be assured that the follow-up trial is going to get done. And we also have renewed and um, increased authority to pull the drug from the market if it doesn't work in the follow-up trial or the company is not um, following through to do the trial that needs to be done. Now, with regard to Alzheimer's, it's obviously a terrible disease without an effective treatment. I think it's too early to draw the main conclusions because we have mixed evidence right now and uh, there's a lot more evidence about to come in. So I'm going to want to talk more about that later. But what I do want to emphasize is that um, the people making these decisions by law are full-time civil servants. By law, they cannot have a financial interest um, or a political interest. I, I am a political appointee, as you know. So those decisions are made by the full-time employees in the civil service at the FDA. And if you, you know, if you tell an umpire, you got to call the balls and strikes, but we're not going to show you the whole pitch coming in. Um, you know, you, you got to be wrong, uh, more often, but you, you make your best determination and go with it. And I'm not saying whether the Alzheimer's decision was right or wrong. Let's, let's wait and see. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very willing to talk about that part of it. But um, so I, I think, I don't think our general approach to accelerate approval is changing, except that we'll have more authority to make sure it's done right now. Would you say the amyloid changes in the amyloid is, is an example of an unvalidated surrogate marker? Yes. Yeah. Uh, although um, by the time all the data is done, I think this year we'll have enough outcome data and intervention data to make that determination. I guess it's tricky if, let's say, I mean, determining that a surrogate marker is validated if the drug lowers uh, lowers amyloid and turns out to have a beneficial effect on Alzheimer's. I don't. It doesn't prove that the next drug that lowers al uh, amyloid will have a beneficial effect. Could be. Let's say. Let's say you have six drugs that lower amyloid, and all six, you, you draw a plot of delta um, um, delta uh, clinical measurement of Alzheimer's state, whichever measure you're using, and delta amyloid, and they're on a, they're on a line. Um, that would tell you you got something there. You, yeah, I think you. everyone's now familiar with the blood pressure and LDL cholesterol levels where you have multiple treatments, and Depending on the delta LDL or the delta blood pressure, you have a commensurate change in outcome. That's the question. Yeah, but it really it requires multiple tests to be sure that it's not just a single drug that maybe has some some other effect that you're not measuring. And um, uh, let me just say one other thing that yeah, people please. should realize is there. Um, and I want to say we welcome criticism at the FDA. Just keep it collegial and in bounds, please. But. Um, Remember that the FDA is looking at everything that's in the field, including data from companies which are not yet able to publish their data. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the problems that, you know, I've worked on my whole career and I've not succeeded is that um, all the drugs that don't make it 
there's no obligation of the companies to make all that data available. And so the FDA is looking at a lot more than what you're able to see in public. And by law, it cannot release commercial confidential information. There are actually criminal penalties for a person that works at FDA who does that. Right. Interesting. Um, you, you said with Alzheimer's or a similarly terrible disease, of course, a parent or a patient would want it if there's any bad evidence that it might help. Uh, and even with a surrogate market that's unvalidated. But then there's the cost thing. You know, the, let's say the medicine costs somebody and probably not the individual, probably an insurer, you know, 100000 500000 a million dollars in some ways based on the decision that you've made. Does that factor at all in your decision making? We are, in essence, prohibited by law from considering cost in our um, assessment of our determination is do the benefits outweigh the risks in the case of a full approval or for the intended use? So that's for the indication in the population study. During the case of accelerated, it's um, the likely uh, benefits and likely risks. It doesn't mean that we're unaware and sensitive to cost or that we don't have personal opinions. I also have a special seat at the table with CMS and the um, in the uh, Department of Health and Human Services where, you know, we're increasingly discussing these issues. But that decision about what we call costs, which as you uh, recognize, costs, uh, charges and costs are not the same thing. You have the same issue in your hospital um, uh, that, you know, what's charged and what it actually costs bear some relationship to each other, but it's not high. That's not an FDA decision. That's really a uh, payer CMS decision in the United States. Yeah, just, I don't know if you're able to take your hat off, but is that a reasonable way to run a railroad to say that the FDA is cost agnostic, may approve a drug because it looks like it might work? Maybe we're not even sure it might work and it's going to cost a million bucks and then there's tremendous pressure on a payer to cover it. I mean, you can imagine other systems where there's some element of the system that is paying a lot of attention to cost and cost benefit in some of those decisions. Well, um, I mean, as you well know, in Europe, there's a tripartite system. You have uh, you have the EMA, which makes the decision if it's a drug. Uh, devices work a little differently in Europe. You have a health tech assessment, which is done by the government with a societal cost effectiveness uh, consideration. And then you have the payers who, based on all that, then uh, do reimbursement, which is less of a uh, decision there and more sort of a mechanical, um, you know, you, you win or lose in that, in that uh, part of it by efficiency. We don't have that in the U.S. And um, I, you know, what I've said is uh, it's not, it's above my pay grade to make that decision. That's elect, uh, elected officials. But what I can do is say, it's like a relay race where we're handing a baton to CMS in particular, um, and we need to make it so that handoff is not just dropping in the dark and having CMS pick it up, but we need to have an evidence um, system that integrates uh, over time the information that we have in a way that's enabling CMS to make best decisions it can about uh, their mandate, which is reasonable and necessary as opposed to safe and effective, and we're working hard on that. You may have seen the CMS propose, um, put out the um, tentative proposal that for accelerated approvals, there might be a lower rate of payment than for full approval, which would give a big incentive to the industry to get those trials um, completed. I'm on the record as saying, I think that's a, a really great idea. It's not um, the favorite in the pharma industry, as you might imagine, but I think it's a it's a it's a uh, one of several things that can be done to help this. And by the way, you sort of portrayed the uh, insurance industry as needing sympathy for the plight they're in. I'm sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to uh, do that exactly. But go ahead. I just, I just had a session with AHIP, the health insurance plans, and I do have a lot of sympathy for CMS because it, you know, like me, um, it's a it's you you're uh, the whole public uh, has the right and sometimes the obligation to criticize you and it's painful um, uh, at times. But 
the health insurance industry, I, I look, when I met with them, I just looked at their profits over the past year. Their question to me was, what was I going to do to make sure that the follow-up studies got done for accelerated approval? And I hit them. I was proud of this. I hit them with the old JFK quote. Uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And my question, I'd say the same thing back to UCSF. What are you doing to create an efficient evidence generation system so that the results come in in a way that give you the evidence you need to practice? And I would argue that um, our American healthcare systems and insurance industry are not doing the job. Got to do better. It's a, in your case, I think there are a lot of people trying in the insurance industry. I, I don't think it's right to sit there making billions of dollars in profit and then ask people, what are you doing to give us the evidence we need? They ought to be making it easier. Your doctors should not be struggling in the clinic to figure out if they're going to get paid for getting a consent and ordering tests that are part of a protocol. Mm -hmm. No, I think to a reasonable critique, where uh, Tool Butte starting this uh, Real World Evidence Center, They're putting a fair amount of emphasis into trying to address the question, but I think you're absolutely right. We haven't done done everything we, we should. I guess my question wasn't so much sympathy for the insurance company. It's just the predicament of a system that now is going to approve drugs that may have very limited efficacy and maybe limited evidence of efficacy is agnostic to cost. The cost is massive. And then I look at the state of primary care, or I look at the state of homelessness, or I look at all sorts of things that are underfunded and wonder, is that just a sensible way to organize the system? And, you know, yes, some of the money is going to pharma and I don't have a ton of sympathy, but I just worry, you know, as I look at the big picture, you just wonder where this takes us. I, th I think the counter argument, which I actually believe is the right one, is that the minute the FDA just like EMA, which also doesn't consider costs, the minute the FDA becomes a political organism, uh, you've lost one of the foundations of medicine. Yeah. And in fact, it's getting that initial approval. If whoever was smart enough in 1962, you know, prior to 1962, the only evidence you needed to market a drug was that doctors would prescribe it. Um, there was no barrier of having to do, uh, you, know, you know, 1962 is when the law for the first time said you have to prove efficacy, and to do that, you have to do adequate and well-controlled trials. If the FDA becomes a purely political animal, um, all that's out the window as far as I'm concerned. No, it, it clearly can't but, be in the FDA where this happens. It has to be some other element of the system. We're in, we're in agreement on that. I think there does need to be um, tuning up of the rest of the system to deal with that other part of it. Yeah, yeah. Let's turn to a couple of other issues. There are tons on, on your plate. Um, how are you thinking about the regulation of AI these days? And did your thinking change when you started playing with GPT-4 and ChatGPT? We are having a lot of interesting discussions about that. As you might imagine, they range from how do we regulate it to how do we use it? I right. Mean, you think about the work of an FDA reviewer, there's a lot of um, sort of or, or those writing guidances and policies at FDA, there's a lot of searching around to find what's out there and what's been written before. You know, we had, just as an example, we're have, we had a vibrant discussion. There's a term called grandfathering, which is now no longer acceptable. The problem we have at FDA is there are hundreds of guidances and rules that have grandfathered the term grandfather in them, and it's used in different contexts, which means you got to go back and find it uh, mm -hmm. to change it. I, there are just so many uh, amazing opportunities ahead, just like I think for your clinicians, the ability to summarize the past history and notes and all that's going to be revolutionized. But um, I think this pause that um, a lot of the leaders have called for in the large language models, big experiments, there's something to that, and I'm relatively certain we're going to have to have much more quick um, regulation at a higher level than I had thought prior to the um, large language model mm -hmm. exposition. Because this stuff really does get a life of its own and very hard to tell what's truthful and what's not and when it's out of control. So um, I, 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 I want to give credit here to uh, CDRH, which way back uh, 
you know, put out the idea that the pre-market part of algorithms is really the small part. The big part is once it's out there, uh, there's got to be a system for right, for auditing and um, updating its quality using, you know, tools that we understand pretty well now. How to do that with large language models, I think it's going to be quite a challenge. Yeah, I can't even imagine what that looks like. I mean, you put in the same query into GPT-4 twice and you're going to get a different answer. So how what how do you even begin to think about the regulatory framework for that uh, when it evolves? It's part of the nature of the beast. It's, it's evolving iteratively every second. Well, you know, I've always thought that one of the beauties of clinical medicine is in the end you have outcomes. And in some cases, outcomes are discrete. Sometimes they're much more complicated, but at least when they're discrete, you can judge a model by how well it does with regard to the outcomes. But for that to work, you got to have a system that measures outcomes. Mm -hmm. and I keep coming back to the evidence generation part. Um, I know uh, a tool is like, a, you know, I admire its global leadership. And I think historically UCSF has been a leader here. But given the technology we have, it ought to be a. It ought to be that we can tune all algorithms based on outcomes because you got a digital record for all your patients over time. We just have to put those systems together and make sure we have the right. Uh, I call it a deal, the right agreement with patients about the privacy part of it to enable it to be used for good purposes and not for bad. Yeah, it really feels it feels like a daunting problem because even if you you know, say, "All right, we're going to measure the outcomes of an algorithm," the algorithm is going to evolve over time if if it's awake, and uh, it just I it, I great sympathy for you and the organization to try to figure this one out. But I, I you know I'm interested in your view on this because I you know I've quoted you many many times about your work on electronic health records and how they haven't done what, you know, we hope they would do. Um, don't you think this advance is going to make it possible to just solve some of these problems that were intractable? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, it, it's very clear to me that the issue of documentation gets much better. A lot of the back office stuff, that's just, you know, tons of people doing tedious jobs, just as you say, looking for, you know, the word grandfather and 10,000 records. That will get better. I think where we get into diciness is when it is replacing clinical judgment or, uh, you know, and it's one thing for it to suggest diagnoses, it's another for it to be making diagnoses. And, uh, you know, the history of humans is that they fall asleep at the switch. If the technology is 99% accurate, then it's going to be that 1% where it doesn't get it right and you're saying to the humans, stay vigilant, but that's not what humans do. They, they, they don't stay vigilant. It's impossible for them to do that. So that's you know that's not easy. Right. The easy part is the back office stuff. In some ways, uh, you know, automating things that already happen, a doctor-patient communication turning into a chart. No, that part seems pretty straightforward. That argument you just made is one of the most important ones in my view, um, and I, I used it a lot when I worked at Alphabet. That um, if if you make it easier for somebody to do something using automation, um, they stop thinking about it. Yeah, there's a real risk in that in healthcare in particular. There are other things you do where it's good. You don't have to think about it. Of course. But, right. but not when you're taking care of a patient. Right. And our physical exam skills have deteriorated because of technology. And some of that is, okay, the technology is better than I am listening for an S3. And uh, as I tell people many times, I don't really remember my wife's cell phone number because it's in my phone. So... You know, you see in the, in the self-driving car, it says, well, you know, it's self-driving, but the, the drivers stay vigilant. Like, that's just not going to work. And so we've got to build in systems for better training and for, you know, what does visions look like when the computer is pretty darn good at doing what you asked it to do? I think that's a real problem, and a big problem for us in training, I think. Um, let's turn to a couple other quick things. They're not quick, but they're big, and I think people want to talk about them. Uh What's you've uh, I saw the approval of Narcan last uh, last week or a couple weeks ago. Sort of the opiate crisis sort of landed in your lap, and obviously the FDA has a critical role there. How are you thinking about addressing it? Maybe talk a little bit about the Narcan decision specifically, but maybe more broadly. Sure, we've got um, you know you think about this mechanistically. You've got prevention. You've got um, essentially resuscitation. You've got um, long term treatment. And you got securing the social and economic circumstances that are undergirding this whole 
thing. And a few of these are squarely in FDA's lane. Um, increasingly, it's a team. I'm, you know, I'm a basketball fan. I love the team concept. Uh, but we need the whole team around the table for parts of it. But what's really clear from uh, we got funding for a really nice model that's been been done out of MIT and a couple of other places. And the number one thing we can do right now is to flood the world with Narcan. And I relate to this easily because, uh, like I said, defibrillation got me started on cardiology. You don't get charged for a defibrillator. Uh, you know, if you drop over dead, you got to get defibrillated if there's one handy. And we're trying to make one handy everywhere. I think Narcan needs to be the same. So over-the-counter Narcan is just one of many things that we're doing. Little known fact is the majority of Narcan now is actually distributed by harm reduction groups, which are public health groups that get it in bulk and essentially give it away. And But, um, you know, the wrinkle on Narcan over-the-counter is that if it's over-the-counter, CMS can't pay for it. So when you consider um, insured people, it may make the price go up. So we've had to do a lot of work to deal with things that, you know, we hope other people don't have to think about that are sort of in the back room. So that's, uh, that's a big deal. But the huge deal now is um, the chemical synthesis of fentanyl in large scale. But large scale means little tiny packets that you can stick underneath automobiles coming across the border mm -hmm. uh, that aren't like the big packages you think about when in the old days. And it's being mailed in... Uh, you know, all the usual methods of mailing it, because uh, cutting out the middleman, which reduces the cost and increases the profit for the cartels that are selling this. Um, and now it's being laced um, with xylazine, which is a veterinary um, anesthetic, which is very important for veterinarians to deal with large animals. And um, it's in also in uh, something that uh, is known as uh, kitty juice or other terms like that for small animals for quick procedures. But xylosine, when injected, causes these huge ulcers that are very problematic. And um, so there's a lot of this which is clearly in the just purely illicit part that um, is not in our bailiwick except for certain parts of it. So I'm spending a lot more time than I thought I would with DEA and uh, we're very involved with the uh, Homeland Security and Border Patrol on the inspections part of it. What's what's your role? You said that's not what you do, but so uh, when they loop you into this, what's the purpose? Well, for example, when something comes across the border, uh, Border Patrol uh, does the initial inspection. And if it's a suspicious looking uh, package, we got agents who are there ready to look at it with testing to see if it's a narco narcotic. Um, one of the eye-opening things that, that I have people do is go to the mail room at JFK, where the largest part of international mail comes in. You would be amazed at what Americans buy over the internet that comes in through the uh, methods. We have a whole army of uh, Labrador retrievers that sniff it out and AI scoping the packages uh, with imaging and all sorts of things that, are, that aren't in our purview. We also have an inspectorate. I actually have a badge. Um, I want. Uh, actually, I will. No, I'd love to see it. <laughs> Here's my badge. If I wanted to arrest you, I could do that, but um, I'm not going to do that today. No, all I've been waiting for you to finally get a job that would impress me. So there you go. Wow. There are a lot of Americans that buy narcotics over the internet, and because the address has a .ca, they think it's coming from Canada, but it's not. I. I I don't know about you, I have a lot of trust in Canadians, but there are a lot of imposter organizations selling really bad stuff that, and you know, so it's not unusual now for the death to be a teenager that thought he or she was getting a party drug and on the first dose is found dead by parents um, in the room. So we're involved in all that, but the number one thing in the long run is gonna be reducing demand. And that's a social problem. And um, I, I hate to keep picking on academic medical centers, but we need you all to build fewer large marble-filled buildings and more um, community clinics out there to um, support and work um, with the places where these things are so problematic. Yeah. Um, 
just the Narcan issue brings to mind, you know, the fact may AI will feed into this, but more and more people are going to be getting more care from digital providers, maybe who they've never met, who are going to be prescribing things or, and there'll probably be increasing patient demand to just get drugs directly from pharmacies and not have to go through providers. How, how are you thinking about, and I know you've put some restrictions recently on what digital pharmacies can do for patients, you know, it, sort of a new world there. How are you thinking that through? Well, if you're referring to the restrictions on telehealth, that's a... Yeah. So, you know, patients who are not, never see a doctor, they see a tele provider or some online provider who prescribes something. And I know you've put some restrictions on the ability of folks to do that. Well, just to be clear, that's DEA, not FDA. But I don't want to throw my friend Ann Milgram, who's a DA administrator under the bus. We actually... I thought you were both now because you got that badge, but maybe I got that wrong. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I, I think that's a policy that was put out as a policy. It's going to be looked at carefully because there's been an uproar from the clinical community. I think appropriately. I think you know I helped uh, found a not-for-profit in Dayton, Ohio during my time at Alphabet. Got a lot of experience in what I would call total care of the addiction problem, and telehealth is essential. But you should also be aware that we have... Um, venture investors who are buying um, digital clinics and paying big bonuses to prescribers to prescribe as much medication as possible. Um, and with Adderall, it's actually contributing to a shortage because um, if you never see the patient, I don't know about you, but it's hard to imagine you can give the kind of care that people need if you never see them. On the other hand, integrated care between intermittent uh, clinic visits and many more short-term digital health visits, I think it's the way to go. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm not trying to um, push this off on other people, but, you know, here's another case where professional standards would be so helpful because the DEA, that's essentially a law enforcement agency. They're not, they're not um, clinicians. They need help from the clinical community. What's the right thing? And I think I had a chance to talk to Jeremy Faust about this yesterday, uh, who writes a very nice column about various things as an emergency doc. But I think people like you um, tend to think that everybody's sort of plowing ahead doing the right thing. And it doesn't cross your vision that for every good thing that we have that's in a chance to make money that's by law, there's a small group of people who will figure out a way to do but really bad things with it. And we got to find the right, you, you talked about attention. There's a real tension there that we need to adjudicate. Makes sense. Um, I need to ask you about abortion, so I will. I know you may be limited on what you can talk about, but uh, uh, there are challenges to the legalization or to the legality of uh, of RU486, and I know you're in the middle of that, so can you tell us what you are able to talk about there? All I can say is that over 20 years ago, we... Um, evaluate the risks and benefits of mifepristone and uh, concluded that the benefits outweighed the risks for the intended use. And over the 20 years, the scientific assessment hasn't changed. Those decisions are made by full-time civil servants. Um, their opinion um, hasn't uh, changed. So the science uh, and the medicine remain the same. I can't comment on the court issues because it's under litigation at this point. Got it. From your time, and we're coming to the end, a couple of last questions. You spent your time at Google and Verily, so you got to see the world from the standpoint of one of the great tech giants in the universe who's thinking about healthcare and tackling healthcare. Uh, did you come away with that enthusiastic about the impact of technology? And if, uh, is it, in some ways, as you said, I've thought a lot about this and some ways, it's been pretty disappointing the first 10 years of healthcare's digital transformation. We're not at Nirvana yet. Well, I'm the kind of person that's always attracted to things that haven't worked before. Something's working well. I don't really want to do it. I figure someone else can do it. So I would say we're still in that place. I mean, if you say, ask the question, who solved the healthcare problem from the big tech perspective, I'd say no one. But if you ask the question, what's the greatest potential to solve healthcare problems? I think it's the integration. It's the use of digital technology to free up the human interactions. And it, it brings me back to the large language models because in many ways, the digital 
technology has led to less human interaction, something you pointed out in your career. But I think we're on the verge of cracking the case there. And then you get to the business model. And I just say, you know, there's so many engineers working at Google who are so much smarter than I am. But one thing that has been constant in my career is that people who haven't been in the medical sphere, who have succeeded other places, assume they can take their knowledge and solve the medical problem. That hasn't worked so far. Yeah, I'm not saying it's because we know what to do on the medical side. It's it's um, it's 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 uh, humbling to get in a room with a bunch of really smart engineers and work on a problem. But somewhere in the middle of these two, I think there's great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, I, I have the same feeling that it's going to work eventually. But as you say, you know, talk to our physicians today and they grumble about documentation. And now the new big number one problem is their digital inbox. So, you know, we've given patients a portal, which sort of democratization of care. That's great. They get access to all their, their information and then they don't understand something and they click a little button says, send a message to your doctor and the doctors are, are on their knees. And so, Maybe that gets solved with technology, but it's a it's a pretty heavy lift, and I think people are now getting used to all these unanticipated consequences that that seem to emerge. But, but Bob, I, I got to say, because it's come up in three different spheres for me already today, um, I I identify with the grumbling, and I think it's for good reason. But you got to ask the question: Why in our healthcare system are the middle people? increasingly growing in the amount of money they make and the numbers and the frontline people are actually delivering the patient care or in the case of the generic drug industry making the drugs um in 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 the case of general pharmaceuticals why for example why the pbms make as much money as the uh, innovators who are inventing and developing the drugs i i think you know, my hope is that the digital technology will allow us to get rid of metal people and put them to work on the front line so that our overburdened clinicians can actually spend the time they need. Uh, that that really is my greatest hope, but it's going the wrong direction right now. I'm with you. I, 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 I hope that's true, and I think it probably will be. I just question is whether it's two years or 20 years from now. I'm not, not that part I'm unsure about. Yeah. Uh, heading to the end, uh, just talk about the next three to five years in in uh, in FDA, sort of the main things that you are focusing on? And if you leave a legacy there, what do what you think, what would you like it to be? Well, um, I try not to think about legacy um, because um, I think- It's being a little old, I get that. But and it leads people to do things they shouldn't do. So what do I think is important for public health in the FDA? I, you know, there's, there are like hundreds of things that each individual center is doing at FDA. If you ask me the number one thing that will reduce mortality most quickly, it's success, been having success with tobacco and vaping. That's top of the list. Um, but in a general sense, that, that affects all of what we do. It's misinformation and evidence generation. The amount of heat and misunderstanding that emanates when we have inadequate evidence, but we have to make a decision or the way I like to say it is the amount of heat is inversely proportional to the quality of the evidence. So across the board, we need a new evidence generation system. I'm very hopeful that between CMS and NIH and us, we're going to work with you know leading institutions and also clinical practices to develop a robust evidence generation system. I would put that right at the top of the list. And we've got to deal with the crises we have, like the... Um, opioids that I described. But as I say, it's more of a team sport. At the beginning, it was us at the FDA and you as prescribers that were creating the problem. And we still have to work on that. But uh, there's a whole different set of issues now. Um, and then we got uh, just one thing to bring up for people to think about. We've got a variety of things in our society, Kratom, um, uh, CBD, um, that are things that we're not going to go to a prohibition on. They're not going to, there's not going to be enforcement of illegal st status. Millions of people are using them. You might call them vices and bad habits. Um, they need a regulatory scheme and they're not foods. They're too dangerous to be foods or um, dietary supplements. Um, so that's something we're going to, we're working with Congress on now is can we have a regulatory pathway that keeps these things in bounds like 
not having uh, children eating gummy bears full of CBD that's causing deaths and emergency room visits, but um, enables commerce to deal with it in a legal way, which keeps it in bounds. Yeah. Well, there's a lot on your plate and uh, grateful to you for the work you're doing, grateful to you for taking the hour to spend with us. And uh, we're proud of having a small part in your uh, in your career path. And uh, we think about you fondly and keep up the great work. Hey, we'll be out there for, we have our 50th wedding anniversary uh, coming up in a, in a few weeks. And we're going to spend it out in the Presidio again. Uh, that's how fond we are of San Francisco. So maybe we'll get together for around the golf out there. I would love that. Great to see you. Thanks, right. Appreciate it. Be well.